impact of climate change can be seen around the globe. It's happening now, and hundreds of millions of people are already suffering the consequences, as detailed in a groundbreaking report by the Global Humanitarian Forum. Floods and rising sea levels have already taken their toll, along with droughts and desertification. 325 million people a year see their livelihoods undermined or destroyed, states the Human Impact Report. It adds that this is set to more than double to 660 million, or 10% of the world's population, by 2030. Climate change is not something that is waiting to happen. It is having a real impact on communities and individuals around the world. Some of them are losing their islands, others have lost their farmlands. More than 300,000 people die annually as a result of climate change. 90% of them from malnutrition, diarrhea and malaria, the remaining 10% from extreme weather events. The number is expected to rise to more than half a million by 2030. When I go and visit people, so many of them from Afghanistan to Uganda say they know something's happened to the climate. The rains are not coming at the usual times, but they really have no understanding why that's happening. More than 4 billion people, around 60% of the world's population, are vulnerable to climate change. Half a billion people in developing countries are at extreme risk, many of them in some of the poorest areas of the world, such as sub-Saharan Africa, according to the report's findings. Humanitarian aid provides relief in many emergencies, but it's not always the best answer to the deadly crises brought about over time by climate change, such as drought. And that's one of the disasters that we understand least about, and also the one that the international community has had great difficulties in coping with. And that's probably one of the reasons why it is so deadly, that it's been treated as a disaster, but it's a very fundamental development issue. The report puts a human face on climate change by putting people at its heart. Rather than underscoring abstract scientific data, it's the first comprehensive study specifically focused on the adverse effects of climate change on human society. It aims to be meaningful to the general public and useful to policymakers. I mean, this report is a starting point, clearly. Yeah? It will, in particular, prompt many people in the research community, but also among the organizations, uh, to take it more seriously, the issue. And we have to get our acts together now. This is where we have to tell the world that unless we look at the humanitarian dimensions of the problem, then clearly we are likely to have a disruption in society in several parts of the world. We are even likely to have failed states. Developing countries bear more than 90% of the burden of climate change while contributing least to the causes, the report states. 99% of deaths linked to climate change occur in developing countries, which often emit the lowest carbon emissions. The report comes at a critical time, just six months before a new deal is due to be thrashed out by negotiators in Copenhagen to set new levels on emissions. Current adaptation efforts to reduce the human impact of climate change were woefully inadequate and needed to be scaled up a hundred times in developing countries. Despite the dramatic consequences of climate change outlined in the report, it warns that its findings are very conservative and the true human impact is likely to be far more severe. In today's topic, we're going to discuss the influence of the increasing amounts of greenhouse gases on the atmosphere. And in other words, just what are the effects of climate change? And in there, you can see that actually we are already experiencing some of these changes. It's just that a lot of us in the developed world are not actually having to experience them firsthand. And there's actually another documentary called The Age of Stupid, which, although it's not a great documentary, what it does do well is it takes different news clips that have happened over the last decade or so and pieces them together in, in such a way that you see all these sort of seemingly independent events, but you bring them together and then you get a clearer picture that, you know, something is going on. And the question it begs is, you know, will people look back um, to us and, and say this was sort of the age of stupid because all this knowledge we have 
why aren't we making changes? And a lot of that can come down to, you know, many, many reasons, including uh, the way our brains have evolved uh, to not be able to comprehend, you know, long-term change or value long-time consequences um, as opposed to short-term gain. But uh, let's just take a look at what the IB um, is looking for when you're discussing the influence of the greenhouse gases. So the first thing they're looking for is to talk about the thermal expansion of the oceans. Now, what that basically means is that as particles get warmer, they spread apart. So let me just illustrate that uh, with a simple model here. So colder water, um, as it warms up, the space in between will expand. So if you imagine the size of the ocean and how many particles of water there are, um, that adds up to a lot of volume. So that would cause the sea level to rise. Another reason for the sea level rise it would be the melting of the polar ice caps. And what happens in that case is water that is now locked above surface, like as ice, it's not adding to the volume of the ocean. Once it melts, then it's going to add to the volume of the ocean because it will be part of it. So both of those can cause the coastal flooding. And as a quick aside, there's also a few pieces related to this. As the oceans warm, or as temperature of any fluid rises, um, its solubility of gases decreases. So in other words, right now, as the ocean's temperature is increasing, it's actually going to be able to hold less carbon dioxide. So as it warms, it will release more carbon dioxide, which will drive more climate change, which will drive more release of CO2, etc., etc. In terms of the polar ice caps, because they're white, they reflect a lot of light away from Earth. Um, if they melt, then there will be more absorption of the light instead of reflection, and that can actually, again, cause more re-radiation of infrared, which can be absorbed and re-emitted by the greenhouse gases. So those are what we call positive feedback systems where once it starts, it sort of accelerates or accentuates the problem. On to droughts. There are areas that, become, uh, that can become hotter um, and as a result they may undergo desertification and that can reduce food production. Now desertification has quite a few variables that affect it. You don't need to really understand them, but a lot of it is related to how we farm, and we'll look at that more in the soil topic. But climate change can affect biodiversity, and if there are if there is a decrease in biodiversity, that can impact the soil, and uh, that can drive erosion and desertification. At the same time, climate change with floods and droughts can also drive erosion and desertification. So with that, we get the reduced food production. Floods. So you get sort of the opposite. Um, as the temperature of the atmosphere rises, storms become more intense and frequent. And that's basically because when you have a higher temperature, what happens is the evaporation rates of the oceans and water in general um, will accelerate. And the amount of water in the atmosphere sort of drives weather. So that will increase intensity and frequency. So as those go in and they sort of flood sort of our food belts, uh, that can reduce our food production. And this is not only on the coast, but more inland. There's actually one little image there, and it's, you know, maybe hitting it over the head too much. But, you know, we do want to start realizing that, you know, it's not just text. There's real-life consequences to these types of things and more often it's hurting the people that can least um, accommodate those kinds of disasters. Uh, in terms of pests and disease, tropical diseases can expand their range. So for example, here there was a study done on how might malaria spread uh, in the future. So right now this is the malarial spread where that you can find malaria and uh, the reds are where it could expand to due to climate change. So then you could have more people at risk for these types of diseases. Also dengue and other tropical diseases as well. Into the last topic there, some areas could get some benefits. So we want to make sure that you realize that it is always about perspective. So from some people's perspective, some places might actually become more fertile than before. 
uh, they might get more rain and just the right amount that doesn't flood and they might actually be better off in that area but the general idea is that if you want to take a look at this from a whole world perspective um, it is generally um, the models are predicting that there's going to be more problems and benefits if you look at it as a whole.